has been a part of my life since I was born. In fact, even before I was born, as my mom listened to music while she was pregnant with me. So naturally, listening to music was one of the first things I did. <laughs> we can thank my mom for some of these pictures. <laughs> and later, my life shifted from listening to music to playing music, when at the age of six, I started learning the piano. Then, I wanted to join the school band, so I started with the alto saxophone. But I wanted to join the orchestra, and the saxophone is not generally an orchestral instrument. So I learned the bassoon at the age of 13. Afterwards, I was inspired by Kenny G, who is one of the best-selling instrumentalists of all time, and a soprano saxophone player himself. So I started learning the sa soprano saxophone at 15, 
which is the instrument you just heard me play. Growing up, my life revolved around music. Before classes, I would be seen rehearsing in the morning some new piano songs, getting the scales, arpeggios right to learn a new song. After school, I would stay with the school band, or I would work with the orchestra. And along the way, to and from somewhere, I was always listening to music, trying to learn new songs, get, basically try to imitate the greats. At the age of 15, when I was in Guatemala, I was playing around with my family. We were all sitting around the table, having a good time. I was playing some fun songs with my younger cousins and uncles and aunts. They were all listening. It was so fun. So afterwards, my grandfather came up to me and asked me, have you ever thought about recording a CD? I said, no. I'm 15. I didn't think I was good enough. I didn't think people would listen to my CD. But he told me, I have a friend who's a director of an orchestra. We can go talk to him and see if he's interested in recording you. So I said, sure, why not? I mean, what's the <laughs> worst that can happen? So we got in the car and drove over to see this director. And when we got there, I played some songs for him, showed him some of my arrangements, and he told me, definitely, we can record you. I was so excited. We started working with the instrumentalists, getting the songs right, arranging the pieces, getting the whole feel for the project. And then it was starting to shape up. Here are some of the covers we were thinking about using. <laughs> as, as all of this, this was coming together, I started to dream. I started to wonder, what if my talents sell? What if people are willing to pay for the CD? What would I do with the money? So I thought, I'm a saxophone player. I'll buy another saxophone. There was one in Paris that I wanted to get, actually. It's the one all the greats played. I thought, if I, too, can learn to play the saxophone, maybe I can sound more like them. Or at least I would feel more like them, as a young boy wearing Messi's same sneakers. But all of these projects, all of these dreams, took a very different direction when I met a young boy in Guatemala named Samuel. I was playing in a clinic in Guatemala, trying to have a good time and give some enjoyment to the patients there. When out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a mother and her young son. It was a sight that I was not expecting. The mom was holding her son close, warmly to her. Tears were coming down her face. Concern was visible all around. So I approached her after I played, and I asked her, what's going on? Is there anything I can do to help you? And she responded, my son has just been diagnosed with cancer, and we have no money to pay for the chemotherapy treatments. So the doctors have only given him a few months to live. That phrase struck with me and hit me to my core. I thought there wasn't really too much separating these natural motherly emotions from some my mom had felt with me growing up. If I, sometimes I would get hurt in school. Sometimes I would not get chosen for a sports team. Maybe I did bad on an exam or had a tough day. My mom, too, was there to cry my tears, to share my concern, and to hold me close to her. However, there were huge differences. My pains and my troubles were temporary. Samuel's were potentially final. This is Samuel. He was eight years old at the time. I thought, how could it be that a boy that was born only a few miles away from me could have such a different opportunity? I knew I had to do something. And I thought, I'm a musician. Maybe I can use my music. So I told the mother, I'm recording a CD right now, and I'm going to go back to the U.S. where I'm living, and I will try to sell it. And all the money we make from the CD will go to trying to give your son a chance. And that's what I did. So I went back to the U.S., and I started telling people about Samuel and telling people about this project. I told, people about, I told my friends about how this boy was struggling to survive. I spoke at businesses. I spoke at civic centers. I performed. But also, as I had done so much growing up to learn about music, I listened. I listened to my friends who told me they wanted to come and help out in my house after school, helping assembling the CDs, getting the packages ready, 
even though they had already completed all the community service hours required by my school, I listened to how they wanted to keep helping. Because this was not about checking a box. This was about saving a life. I listened to businessmen tell me the whole concept of short-term goals and urgent needs took a very different tone when hearing about a young boy trying to survive cancer. And I listened to an old lady tell me after a performance that she wanted to do more than just give money. And she wrote a letter to Samuel, which I later, later read to him, and it brought a smile to his face. After a few months of working on this project and much help from all around, we were able to raise all of the money for Samuel's chemotherapy treatments, and he is still alive today. I knew I could do more, though, so I recorded another CD later. And the purpose of the CD was to help other Samuels in Guatemala. And I helped this program called Ayudame a Vivir, which means help me to live in Spanish, help provide chemotherapy treatments for children who are unable to pay for them through the proceeds from my music. I thought, maybe this is giving all of my music a purpose. All the scales I've been rehearsing from a young age could become scales of warmth. The arpeggios I had rehearsed to join an orchestra could become arpeggios of love. And the songs I was recording and arranging and writing could become songs of life. And this showed me that maybe my talents had a deeper purpose than just trying to win an orchestra competition or get in a specific band or school. I realized that some of the things I'd been chasing were so little compared to the problems of others. Some of these ideas were reinforced after a conversation with my greatest inspiration, Kenny G. At the age of 17, I heard that Kenny G was going to be performing very close to me. So I thought, this is my chance. If some of you can think about, think of who you admire, who you respect, who you would love to meet, what it would be like to see them in person. I was there, and I remember when Kenny G walked into the auditorium where he was performing, I just turned over to my mom and said, he's really here. <laughs> I was in complete awe. Because on one hand, he inspired me to learn the soprano saxophone, and he inspires me by his music. But also, he does a lot of charity work. He works with many organizations providing money, but also instruments to kids. And he's one of the founders of Starbucks. So he inspires me in business, too. So after the concert, Kenny G was there to meet all the people who were attending. So I waited in line. I didn't care. The line was very long. I was going to wait, and I could already see him, and I was so excited. I was like, here I come, one person at a time, getting closer to my dream. <laughs> when I saw him, I told him about some of the, how he inspired me with saxophone, told him about some of the stuff I had done in music, but I also told him about Samuel, and then I listened to his response. Kenji told me the following words. He told me, that's what it's all about. Your talents are not just for yourself. They are to bring joy and happiness to others. Joy and happiness to others. I thought this is a very natural fit for music. In fact, for arts in general. The arts are about sharing your emotions on a stage, showing others how to feel a certain emotion and identify with it. But I wondered, could this idea of sharing joy and happiness with others resonate in other parts of your life? in other parts of my life? For example, right now, I'm a student at ESA in the first year. I'm getting a Master's of Business Administration. I wonder if we, and some of you too, and I'm thankful you're all here, I wonder if we have talents here. I wonder if we have chances to serve. And I think we do in both. Perhaps our talents are not musical, though for some of you they are. Here we're learning how to analyze businesses, but we're really learning how to make decisions through the various aspects of a company, whether it's marketing, accounting, operations, finance, and the list keeps going. These are our talents. These are opportunities we have to learn how to understand a business that many don't have. And also, how can we serve? After we graduate, we too will be in the business world. We will have an impact in many ways. We will have clients, we will have coworkers. We will have employees who work with us. We will have investors or shareholders of the business. The way we treat each of these stakeholders 
will determine how we live and how we serve others. So in fact, the talents we're acquiring through this program and through many similar programs are ways that we can use them to then serve others after we finish through our business. I thought about all of this like, as I admire Kenny G. I may never be a Kenny G. I may never be as successful as him in music or business or charity. I may not help thousands of people or inspire millions to learn the saxophone, but I helped one person. In much the same way, we too are inspired by business leaders, by the many things they have done. We can dream of being a Bill Gates, but maybe we don't need to be a Bill Gates. Maybe we can have a deep impact on one person, and that's enough. And by doing so, we too can bring joy and happiness to others. So I encourage each of you to go out there and think of what are the things you're currently doing and how these two can become your talents and then how you use those to serve those around you, to help your community. And by doing so, you too will find your greatness and realize that some of the things you may have been chasing are not as important as the person who needs you next door. Thank you very much.